this is the white whale. This is yeah. the half court shot for everything. The far CUI rule will be published in 2024. All right, folks, it's spooky season, and we got a spooky one for you today. The FAR CUI rule is officially back from the dead. The zombie rule <laughs> the zombie rule is here 14 years after Executive Order 13556 established the federal CUI program. We are now just a few weeks away from seeing the mythical FAR CUI rule for the very first time. In general, you can think of the FAR CUI rule as the DFARS 7012 clause for all federal contractors rather than just defense contractors. Most people don't even remember that the FAR CUI rule was supposed to be the star of the show for the federal CUI program all along, and that DOD cyber regulations have simply been placeholders in the interim. So today, we're going to talk about what the FAR CUI rule is and what we think it might say. Today, we're also going to paint pictures of happy CUI, Jacob. <laughs> happy CUI that's about to be protected across the entire federal contracting base, and nothing makes me happier. It's insane to think that as I sit across the screen from you, you were a full-fledged human being with a beard uh, as this rule kind of went into development. And now that it's coming out and it's going to be released... This is what's left of you. You have withered away to dust, much like much of the hopes of protecting CUI over the past eight years. There is new happy trees ahead, folks. That's right. That's right. We have been waiting on the FAR CUI rule for so long, I am literally dead now. Okay, so <laughs> quick history lesson. We've done a longer podcast about seven months ago on the details and the history of the FAR CUI rule, but this is very important. So we're going to recap it here for everybody to make sure that we're on the same page. I cannot stress enough that the FAR CUI rule is a really big deal. So it's very important that you know where, where it came from, where it's been stuck, and where we're going from here. Okay, so back in 2010, Executive Order 13556 established the federal CUI program. The National Archives and Records Administration gets designated as the executive agent in charge of the federal CUI program. A division within NARA called ISU, the Information Security Oversight Office, gets tapped to do the dirty work and make everything happen to implement the federal CUI program. And as we recently found out and recently covered in a podcast, they didn't have a very fun time doing this. The former ISU director referred to this saga as ISU's Vietnam, something that they got into got stuck in and could never get out of. Anyways, they came up with a three-part plan for implementing the federal CUI program. And the three-part plan consisted of the CUI registry, a federal CUI rule, and a FAR CUI rule. The CUI registry organized and simplified 2,600 different authorities on the books that governed unclassified data protection and over a hundred different marking systems that the, federal, the various federal agencies had for marking essentially data that all needed to be protected at the same level. So they spent years and years and years coming up with what we now refer to as the registry, which is a much, much more straightforward system than the total chaos that we had prior to that. The second part of this uh, plan was a federal CUI rule. This is a regulation that would regulate how every agency protects, handles, and shares CUI internally and amongst each other. CUI was categorized at the moderate impact level. Therefore, the moderate baseline of 260 controls in NIST SP-853 is the starting point for protecting CUI in federal environments per the federal CUI regulation. And the last part, the part that's most important for contractors, was a FAR CUI rule, a federal acquisition regulation that would extend protections for CUI in all federal contracts. This would regulate how contractors protect, handle, and share CUI in non-federal environments. And as the DOD, and as they used to describe this in the past, 
the direct quote was, this FAR rule is necessary to ensure uniform implementation of the requirements of the CUI program in contracts across the government, thereby avoiding potentially inconsistent agency level action. That was the standard boilerplate description of the FAR CUI rule from any federal agency person, DOD, GSA, NARA, didn't matter. That was the reason why you needed the FAR CUI rule. Now, the problem was, was that steps one and two, the registry and the federal CUI regulation took a really, really long time, like six years, uh, five or six years for these things to come together after the executive order was actually published. So in the interim, DOD had promulgated their own DFARS rule that created DFARS 252204712 because they couldn't wait around for years and years and years for the CUI program to do its thing. They needed to get started protecting their data right away. So this created a problem. NARA wanted the full uh, NIST SP853 moderate baseline, the 260 plus controls for contractors, not just for federal environments. They wanted this massive catalog of protections for CUI via this FAR rule. DOD, in contrast, important to note here, everybody who beats up on the DOD for imposing a lot of requirements, they wanted a really small number of 853 controls, like 50 or 60 of these controls. And DOD said, well, listen, uh, this is what we have in the DFARS for now. As soon as the FAR CUI rule comes out and provides federal wide guidance, we'll just defer to the FAR rule because you're almost done with the FAR rule, right? Well, it turned out NARA said, we haven't even started working on the FAR CUI rule yet because we've been too busy trying to come up with the CUI registry and the federal uh, agency level CUI rule. And so they had to come to a compromise. And what popped out of that compromise was NIST SP 800 That was actually the compromise of DOD and NARA figuring out what the acceptable baseline was for contractors for CUI because the FAR CUI rule was taking so long. Okay, so we got the registry, we got the federal CUI regulation in 2016, and then even as late as 2018 during conferences and events, government people would constantly talk about how soon the FAR CUI rule would be out, the pending FAR CUI rule. It's coming out, it's coming out, it's right around the corner. It's the last part of the three-part plan. And as we talked about in the episode uh, several months ago, one thing led to another. The FAR CUI rule got put on the shelf. It languished. It didn't go anywhere. It got seemingly forgotten about despite pleadings from the ISU director in their annual reports to the president, which we covered in the ISU's Vietnam podcast a little while ago, which we'll link to. Anyways, years and years and years go by. People completely forget that the FAR CUI rule is a thing. And then finally, the FAR CUI rule goes up for regulatory review in the summer of 2022, only for it to get sent back for more revisions. Then in March of 2024, it goes from uh, the FAR CUI rule team over to uh, regulatory review. And then in May, it gets sent up for additional regulatory review. And then five months later, in October of 2024, the FAR CUI rule officially cleared regulatory review. And now we expect to see the proposed rule published before Thanksgiving of 2024, 14 years after the publication of Executive Order 13556 told everybody to start the federal CUI program. Take a deep breath. This is the craziest aspect of all this. First and foremost, if history tells us anything when it comes to the release of rules or documents, if we're expecting it by Thanksgiving, it will be on the last business day before offices let out before Thanksgiving and yeah. right before those offices close, just so that you can circle it on your calendar and you can expect it, right? Um, one, you know, just summarizing some of the things that, that you mentioned in that brief history is essentially this, is that right now, um, what you see is the role, the FAR CUI role that everybody expected to be implemented to uh, protect CUI across the entire federal, federal government was delayed because there were other measures that had to take place. But the DOD saw a more stringent need uh, to expedite that process and went and created their own program, like you said, right? That program spun up. 
I think the craziest thing to relate about all of this is that all of a sudden we started seeing the DOD's program kind of coming into its final stages. And that's when we started seeing appearances in national strategies, appearances and agendas and things like that, that kind of said, not only making uniform regulations, but making it a priority to protect CUI. It wasn't DOD specific and it wasn't in DOD specific uh, strategies, right? It was across national strategies and my beards and my nose. Um, but so it, I, I think that, that once we started seeing those things in the agenda, then all of a sudden we started seeing all of these uh, snowballs start to roll and get bigger, right? You started seeing the far CUI rule come back to life. Now all of a sudden it's moving through a process that it was stalled up in for seven to eight years. And yeah. I think that that's the most fascinating thing is that I think that it's all according to plan. Everybody's like, it was taking so long. Yeah, there's all these reviews. But realistically, once things started hitting the agendas and once the DOD program came kind of into its final stages, you started seeing more progress with this, more mentions of this, more rumblings of this. And it's a real deal. I think it's way bigger than the DOD program. It touches way more, obviously. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, in the in the in the years since people have just affiliated CUI and CMMC and all of these issues as DOD specific issues. And that could not be farther from the truth. If you go back to really just a few years, uh, the FAR CUI rule was the missing part of the plan. Uh, and so there's a lot of people probably even in the CMMC ecosystem who don't know that this is supposed to extend well into the rest of the federal environment, not just the DOD environment. Anyways, so I we can tell you a good portion of people that don't know are the people that were like, you know what, I'm just not going to do business with the DOD anymore. I'll just depend on these other contracts with the government, yeah. right? I yeah, think that is... that's a good portion, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So 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 we've covered the history, uh, you know, briefly. We've covered the history in depth in a previous episode. So let's just touch on what the rule might say. We won't know for sure until the rule is absolutely, you know, actually published, which should be relatively soon. What we do know for certain is that MIST SP 800171 will be regulated as the minimum standard for protecting all categories of controlled unclassified information involved in all federal contracts. It is a federal wide minimum baseline for all categories of CUI as part of the federal wide CUI program not just a DOD specific requirement. So if you think a SB 800 is too big of a burden and the unlucky defense contractors are the only ones that have to deal with it, you are mistaken. That is coming for everyone. Now, we can only speculate about the rest of the rule and who knows how long the actual rule is, but there's a couple things to consider. One, Will there be an incident reporting requirement similar to the incident reporting requirement in DFARS 7012 paragraphs C through G? It wouldn't make much sense for them to require the protections of the data, but not require reporting around incidents involving the data. So I imagine that there will be some form of incident reporting requirements similar to what's in DFARS 7012. Would would it be one of those cases where the Circio rule kind of overlaps that, or you know, yeah. you know, like, hey, reference this already established reporting requirement? It could be. It could be. I mean, so for you know anybody that's not familiar, uh, uh, CISA published the Circia incident reporting rule, which Congress passed a piece of legislation that made them issue this rule to try to harmonize and normalize incident reporting requirements across all federal agencies. But that is not a final rule yet. The proposed rule had its comment period close out. I have no idea what level of coordination has happened between CISA's CERCSIA rule and the FAR CUI rule. Uh, I assume that there will be a reporting requirement, but I have no idea if they preemptively coordinated that or not. Um, so we'll just have to see. I would imagine that there's definitely going to be an incident reporting requirement. So if you look at if you're not a defense contractor and you look at DFAR 7012 and you go, man, incident reporting within 72 hours is kind of crazy. I would imagine that there's probably something very similar to that in the FAR CUI rule, if I had to guess. I, I would also, uh, you know, if I were a betting man, which I may be, um, I would be willing <laughs> to bet that it would resemble what's in the DOD, uh, like reporting requirements somewhere along the lines, like not word for word. And the, and the reason why is because I jump uh, on a lot of posts um, that you make with regards to, uh, you know, similarities to the rules or, or just in, in conversations that I have about the similarities to the role. And, and a line that sticks out to me is the consistent 
wanting to unify regulatory requirements across the board. That stands for reporting. That stands for the implementation of cybersecurity requirements. There, there is, in all of the nesting dollar strategies, there, there is consistent mention of trying to make things uniform so the same protections are expected across the board, right? There's no yeah. variance. So I could see easily where um, for the, for this rule, is especially, um, they take in already established things that they need to have, established incident reporting requirements, established implementations of baselines for security protections are things that they rely on. You've often talked, you have often talked and said that the DOD's program was the canary in the coal mine for everybody else. I think that right now uh, that there's no more validation to those state that to that statement than kind of what we're seeing play out. You know, the, the writing on the wall. Yeah. So, so say. yeah, I mean, the federal the federal CUI program was the original harmonization. Uh, things like the FAR CUI rule and the CUI registry was harmonization before the term harmonization was cool. So uh, so yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so something else to consider here: <clears throat> Will there be an external verification requirement? or will self-attestation be federal policy? Will it be left up to individual agencies to determine whether they want external verification of 800-171 in federal contracts? So CMMC is DOD's verification program for contractors to prove that they're implementing the requirements imposed on them by DFARS 7012. So if the requirements are imposed on all federal contractors via the FAR CUI rule, will there be a requirement for them to get CMMC certified? Because that's a program that verifies the implementation of 800-171. Uh, the 32 CFR CMMC final rule uh, doesn't really take a position on this. It doesn't say you can't do that. It just says this is left open if people want to leverage it for other agencies, if they want to leverage it for proof that they're you know, implementing these requirements for other federal contracts, then they're totally free to use their proof of CMMC certification if that's what they want to do. So we will have to wait and see if the FAR CUI rule mandates uh, a verification requirement or if each individual agency will have to promulgate a rule that says go get a certification similar to what DOD has done with CMMC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, again, we hope that they see some of the the past heartburn that was caused by some of the methods that may be chosen, and, and they choose to go against those. See what has happened, learn from history's mistakes, and, and make sure that you don't replicate it so that you can make some actual progress. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So the last part here, probably the spookiest part for spooky season, is. Mm -hmm. FedRAMP moderate equivalency is not a federal policy. FedRAMP moderate equivalency is the requirement if you are going to store, process, or transmit CUI data in the cloud as a defense contractor. Because DFARS 7012 says when you put our data in the cloud, it needs to be at least FedRAMP moderate equivalent. Because back in the day, uh, it was very, very difficult to get a hold of FedRAMP services, and it was almost impossible to get a hold of FedRAMP services if you were a contractor. So they wrote this language into 7012, circa 2015, 2016, that said, if you're going to put our data in the cloud, just make sure it's equivalent to FedRAMP moderate. Now, as we found out in January, uh, that has been an abject failure, and the DOD has tried to mop up the mess with memos and clarifying equivalency and chasing their tail and chasing down cloud service providers and uh, you know people who are offering cloud-based apps in the DoD ecosystem and they're being a little dishonest with what equivalency means. It's just it's a humongous mess. It's a humongous mess. DoD clearly doesn't like the concept. It probably is a concept that doesn't need to exist anymore because the circumstances around limited FedRAMP offerings uh, 10 years later is far different than it was back in 2015. But again, this is a federal-wide acquisition regulation, not a DOD acquisition regulation. So the question is, will FedRAMP moderate equivalency be federal policy or not? I don't think that the FAR CUI rule will include equivalency as the language. I think that it will straight up say, if you're going to put covered data in the cloud, it needs to be a FedRAMP certified cloud. I hope, again... So, so all we can do is hope that, that people see what a big 
I don't want to say joke because it was an attempt to make sure that we opened up the avenue for everybody, but it's just turned out to be a very difficult scenario. What does it mean? How do we go about it? How do we get it? I think that very few people have attained it and it's not even valid anymore. Right. So like, um, sorry, this thing is killing me. Um, but, but when it comes, when it comes to the fact that now we get this federal wide regulation, we hope that all of the things that everybody's grumbled about, and all of the times that it was either placed in the wrong rule or whatever it is, when there's time to comment on this regulation, that those comments are made and then we make those changes, right? And one of those changes would be, I, I don't think, I agree with you, I, I do not think that we are going to go backwards and the federal government is going to adopt something that the DOD made specific just because, I and I, I stand by this, I feel like that that and, and waivers are two things in the CMMC concept or, or that they come from the DOD as a, a part of the whole protection of CUI scheme um, that were put there because they had to be there, but the, the probability of them happening isn't very large, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we know that 171 is going to be the minimum standard for everybody. We know that the rule is going to be out before Thanksgiving of 2024. We've been waiting on this thing for 10 years, seven years, two years since it went up for the first time. We've been waiting for years and years and years, hence my appearance today. Uh, and pretty soon the mystery will be revealed to everyone of what federal policy will actually be. Uh, okay, so the same process still exists if you're trying to get ready as a general federal contractor as you are for a DOD contractor. So if you're looking for a place to start, check out our free Pathfinder tool on the Summit 7 website. Very simple questionnaire that walks you through a couple of simple questions and it'll give you a roadmap for how to get started. Also, if you have been listening to this podcast for the last two years, happy anniversary. Uh, October is our two year anniversary of running the podcast. And here's the scariest story of them all for Halloween. Only about 10% of our listeners are actually subscribed to this channel. So if you've gotten any benefit from this channel, if you've gotten any helpful information from this channel, please like and subscribe. It does help a lot. It'll help us go for another two years uh, and hopefully help me uh, come back from the dead, as it were. So that's the situation with the FAR CUI rule. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. See you next week.